Today on America's Test Kitchen, we're heading to France. Bridget makes Julia the ultimate fougasse bread. Adam reveals his top pick for automatic soap dispensers. And Becky makes Bridget a classic Provençal vegetable soup. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. In ancient Rome, panus focus was a simple flatbread that was baked in the ashes on the hearth. The hearth translating in Latin to focus. Now, over the years, this simple bread spread and diversified all over Europe into loaves like the Italian focaccia, the Catalonian fogasa, and last but not least, the French fougasse, which is what Bridge is going to show us how to make today. Julia, do you like crust? Yep. Yeah, well, this <laughs> is for you. This bread is really about the ratio of interior crumb to crust. And what it is, is it's basically a flattish bread, and it's manipulated and shaped, so it has all this interior lacing that allows for more crust development. I'm in. We're not using all whole wheat flour, but we want enough just to give a little bit of that nuttiness, that weedy flavor. But we need to sift it through a fine mesh sifter, and that's to get rid of the outer bran, any little bits of that, because that really impedes gluten development. So this is a quarter cup, or one and a third ounces, of whole wheat flour. Just gonna quickly sift it in there. Now, the rest of the ingredients go in. This is three cups or 15 ounces of all-purpose flour. One and a half teaspoons of table salt and a teaspoon of instant or rapid rise yeast. Now, this is one and a half cups or 12 ounces of water. So about 75% hydration level is just right. So now this is going to go on low speed, just for about five to seven minutes. And what I'm looking for is the dough should come together in a cohesive mass. We shouldn't see any dry pockets. So five, maybe seven minutes. All right. All right. It's been about five minutes. And the dough's looking good. You can see it cleared the sides of the bowl. No little dry pockets of flour. And now I'm going to move this to a bowl. I've gone ahead and oiled this with extra virgin olive oil. We're gonna use that later on in the recipe too, so why not here? It's gonna prevent the dough from sticking to the bowl. All right, so that looks good. Now I've got a piece of plastic wrap down here. And we are gonna let this rest at room temperature for about 30 minutes before we move on to the next step. Okay. So whole wheat flour adds a nutty, complex flavor to the fagasse, but we're careful not to add more than a quarter of a cup. Here's why. White flour is made with just the endosperm of the wheat grain, which contains starch and proteins. And it's these proteins that form gluten when mixed with water and gives the bread its structure. Whole wheat flour is made from the whole grain, the germ, the bran, and the endosperm. Now the germ adds flavor in a minuscule amount of fat, while the bran adds flavor and bulk. But too much bran is a bad thing because it gets in the way of gluten development. The two main ingredients in most bread doughs are water and flour. The proteins in the flour need the water in order to find each other inside the dough and to link up into the strong network that we call gluten. Here's how the particles of bran and the whole wheat flour get in the way of that process. Bran absorbs lots of water, essentially stealing it away from the gluten. So with less water available to it, the gluten isn't able to move around freely in the dough and therefore forms fewer links, making a weaker network. The bran particles also physically get in the way and prevent the small gluten links from forming longer chains. And without these longer chains, you can't form a strong gluten network. All right, it's been a half an hour. The dough is sat here. So now we're going to start manipulating it a little bit and start forming gluten. Now we want a specific interior texture or crumb inside this bread. We want it to be nice and lacy with small holes and larger holes. And you do that by developing the gluten slowly. Mm. So in order to do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little corner of the dough and push it towards the middle. Then rotate the bowl 45 degrees and do it again. So I'm gonna go around here a total of eight times, just like that. I am gonna put the plastic back on. We're gonna let this rest for 30 minutes. We're gonna repeat this cycle three more times. Now after the last fold, we're gonna put the plastic on. This is going to go into the fridge for at least 16 hours, up to two days or 48 hours in advance. Okay. All right, so we went through the four stages of dough, resting and then folding four times. So fugas is known for taking on many different shapes. Some people will do beautiful sand dollars. Some people will turn it into a ladder. We're going to do probably the most traditional shape, which is a leaf. It's beautiful, it's simple, lots of opportunities for crust development. All right, so before I turn this out on my board, I wanna flour it. 
And this is a well hydrated dough, so we don't have to worry too much about it being over floured. Let me get this out of the bowl. I'm going to be gentle here. I really don't want to disturb too many of those air bubbles that we've taken the time to develop. Now I am going to get rid of any of these larger bubbles on the outside. That's fine. But what I want to do is kind of pat and pull this out roughly an eight inch circle. It looks spot on. Now I'm going to put a little bit of flour on my bench scraper here because I'm going to use it to cut it right in half. We're going to make two loaves. And later mm. on you and I are going to have some fun. This is how we're going to start getting that triangle shape. So I like to think of this as being in three parts. See the three triangles if I do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to bring this towards the center, just like that. Get it so it's attached, and then bring this one up. I'm going to pop that bubble just like that. Just get it into a rough triangle. All right, so that looks good. Now I am going to move this over to a rimmed baking sheet. I want to flour it so it doesn't stick to the sheet. And this is going to go right over there. Mm. And now this is going to relax and slump a little bit. All right, so now these are going to go under a sheet of plastic. I went ahead and sprayed this with vegetable oil spray. Cover it loosely. And now we want these to warm up so we can continue to shape them and turn them into the beautiful leaves. So these are gonna sit here at room temperature for about 30 minutes or up to an hour or really until the dough no longer feels cold. Okay. All right, so it's been about 30 minutes. The chill is off. Okay, and they've relaxed quite a bit. They sure have, as promised. So we're done here with this plastic wrap. Now, I'm gonna have you shape one and me shape one. So I do need to flower our bench here. There you go. Thank you. And one for me. So we are gonna use a rolling pin to gently coax this out into the right shape. So what we're looking for at the start is this end towards us is mm -hmm. eight inches. And then the two longer sides of the triangle are about 10 inches long. So gentle is the game. There we go, eight by 10. All right, you've got mm -hmm. a piece of parchment on an overturned baking sheet. This is our makeshift baking peel. Oh, I like it. All right, so I'm just gonna put this up here. Now I wanna take some cornmeal and dust the surface here. Add some nice texture to the bottom of the bread. We're going to move this bread onto our baking sheet. So now we're going to cut little slits into the bread and this is where we get a lot more crust because now we have more edge. So we're gonna start about an inch and a half from one of the edges. I'll just cut right down the middle up to about an inch and a half from the other side. Now we chose a pizza wheel or a pizza cutter because it was just so much easier than using a knife or a pair of scissors. So now we're going to make a series of veins off of the center vein. So I'm going to use this. Now you don't want to cut into the center vein again. You don't want to cut on the outside. Yeah. It just looks like a torn leaf. Yeah. I'm going to start about third way down from this middle vein here. And I'm going to make my first cut pretty close to parallel. It's okay. not quite perpendicular to that first cut. And on the other side. All right, so about another third of the way down, we're going to make another cut. And now I'm just angling it a little bit mm. more. And then on the other side. And then at the bottom, you're gonna open it up just a little bit more. This is really where it starts to take shape. We're going to stretch and pull this until the leaf shape really starts to open. We wanna see some space in between these slits. All right, so now we're gonna leave these alone. We want them to sit for another 30 to 45 minutes. Let them prove, get nice and bubbly and start to rise. They should be about doubled in size. But we do need to put a piece of plastic. We've gone ahead and sprayed it with vegetable oil spray and then we can start to bake. All right, it's been about 45 minutes. That is a fun shaped bread. Gorgeous bread, isn't it? All right, so it's about ready for the oven. We need to do one more thing and that is coat this with some seasonings, but first, extra virgin olive oil. You have two tablespoons, mm. I have two tablespoons. You wanna get it on the top, the sides, into those little fissures everywhere. Okay. Every inch is coated. It's true. All right, so now we're going to add some seasonings. Rosemary is perfect here. This is a tablespoon of minced rosemary. So I'm gonna sprinkle about half on each one of them. So about a teaspoon and a half per loaf. And you definitely wanna use fresh rosemary here, not dried. And now sea salt. Now this is a coarse salt. These are sea salt flakes. We love the texture of this. It's going to add some nice crunch on top of the bread. So this is two teaspoons total, so a teaspoon per loaf. 
All right, so these are going to go into the oven. These are actually going to go into two ovens. I've yeah. set up two identical ovens for each of us. So these are going to go into the oven set to 450 degrees until they're nice and golden brown. That's gonna take about 18, maybe 22 minutes. And halfway through, we'll rotate each of these. Okay. Now we're gonna keep these on the parchment and just slide it right on. The pizza stone is essential for a nice bottom crust. All right, ooh, ooh thank you. Beautiful. They're gorgeous. Now these have got to rest for 15 minutes, cool down just a little bit, and then we'll eat. Okay. 15 minutes. <laughs> these look terrible. Uh, they do, they're, they're awful. No one should eat them but us, right? <laughs> exactly. All right, so this is the one that you made, and I'm mm. gonna put it here between these other two shapes. We're gonna save this for a little later on. Isn't that gorgeous? Well, look at these other shapes. This is that sand dollar that you mm -hmm. talked about, and that's the ladder. The ladder, yeah. I'd like to climb that ladder. <laughs> so in addition to other shapes, there's a few other flavor variations in addition to the rosemary and salt we have here. You can find those on our website. No knife. This is all about the crust with that chewy interior. You don't want to slice it. You want no. to tear it open. I do. <laughs> then you go first. Oh, I'm going to go on this end. Nice. Oh. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Look at that nice uneven texture in the crumb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. It is like the best crust of a pizza I've ever had. It's crunchy on the outside, but the inside has flavor and it's chewy. Then you get a little of that olive oil and the rosemary and the salt. Yeah, there's some good tug in there, nice texture inside here. And what I like about it is it's still moist inside. I love this little bit of cornmeal on the bottom too. Just even more crunch. Bridget, this is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So if you wanna make this classic French bread, start by sifting whole wheat flour before combining it with all-purpose flour. Knead the dough on low speed for just five minutes, then let it rest on the counter for two hours, stopping to fold it every half hour. Let the dough rise slowly in the refrigerator, then shape and slash into that iconic looking loaf. Before baking, top with olive oil, rosemary, and coarse salt. From America's test kitchen to your kitchen, an authentic recipe for fugas. Delicious. Mm -hmm. mm. Here's a riddle for you. You've got dirty hands from working in the kitchen, but how do you get to the soap without contaminating the soap dispenser? Well, enter the automatic soap dispenser and enter Adam Reed, who's gonna tell us which one was the winner of our testing. It's sort of a culinary catch-22. <laughs> Your hands are dirty, you don't wanna contaminate the soap dispenser, but you need soap. We have four different models of automatic soap dispensers. Hands-free, battery-operated, use it with a motion sensor so it knows you're there. The price range was $25 to $60. I use one of these at home and I have to tell you, it's a game changer. I have always been careful about washing my hands before I cook and during cooking. And now I have to say, I wash my hands every time I pass through the kitchen. Really? It's great. And more hand washing can't be a bad thing. The tests were far and wide. Testers first got their hands greasy with olive oil. They also got their hands contaminated with raw poultry and then used each dispenser <laughs> five times. Wow. They tested the activation distance, the uh, responsiveness of the sensor by holding their hands at varying heights and distances away. Okay. They used each dispenser 20 times on a wet surface to see whether it would shift while it was being used. They used each dispenser about 15 times to calculate the volume of soap dispensed in each instance. And in the last test, they timed how long it took from activating the sensor to getting your soap. Now, before getting soap out of these, you have to put soap into them. Right. Liquid soap for all of them. Some of them were easier to fill than other ones. This one, for instance, had a very small opening at the top of the soap reservoir, so you had to be a little careful pouring the liquid soap in there. Also, the soap reservoir was opaque. There was a tiny little window here <laughs> that's supposed to give you a sense of how much soap is in there, but it was hard for testers to see. And in fact, some of them even overflowed this guy by sure. accident. So it's much better if your soap reservoir is like the one right in front of you. If it's clear, you can see how much soap is in there. Right. And if you have a much wider opening. Getting soap out of one of these dispensers should be kind of an instant gratification thing. Sure. And these two, took about four seconds to dispense the soap. 
doesn't sound like a long time, four seconds. Right. But it felt like a long time. Right now. You want it right now. There was a second problem with these in that the soap was dispensed in this sort of web of wispy, sloppy threads mm. because the nozzles at the dispensers were open and circular and they just didn't cut off the flow of soap very neatly. Gotcha. These two in front of you did a much better, much faster job. They dispense soap in less than a second. And they're made by the same company and they feature what the company calls a no drip valve, which actually turned out to be a no drip valve. Works as advertised. It's a little silicone valve. It's shaped like an upside down triangle and it really cut off the flow of soap very neatly. Testers also tried the different distances and they found that all of the sensors were pretty responsive. They could hold their hands anywhere from an inch to two and a half <laughs> inches in front of the machines and get the soap out. So these two were the top performers. They're both made by the same company, Simple Human. And this is the winner. This is the Simple Human sensor pump. It's about $40. And testers gave it the edge for a couple of reasons. It's got this transparent soap reservoir. It's got a nice big opening so it's easy to fill. And it's also got the smallest footprint of all of these so it's going to take up less space by the sink. There you go. If you want to keep your hands nice and clean, then pick up the winning automatic soap dispenser. It's the Simple Human Sensor Pump and it retails for about $40. Today we're making soup a pistou, which hails from the French region of Provence. Now it's very similar to a minestrone, it's chock full of lots of good vegetables. But before soup a pistou is served, a dollop of pistou, which is similar to a pesto, is stirred in at the last minute. Becky's here and she's going to show us an amazing version that is actually really easy to make. It is. And you know what? Let's be real. Vegetable soups can be kind of bland sometimes. Snoresville. Yeah. Boring. <laughs> but not this one. And that's because of that pea stew. It really, really adds a lot of personality to this soup. Okay. We're starting with a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil that I have over medium heat. Okay. And that'll be ready to go when it's shimmering. We'll start by adding one leek. This has been cut into half inch pieces and then washed really, really well because you know leeks get really gritty and sandy. Definitely. Inside. Then we have one celery rib that's cut into half inch pieces, one carrot cut in quarter inch pieces, and a half a teaspoon of salt. So this is our base here for the soup and we're going to let this cook for eight to 10 minutes until the vegetables get nice and soft. Okay. Okay, so it's been about 10 minutes and things are starting to smell good in the kitchen. It's always a good start smelling aromatics. Can't go wrong. Of a soup recipe, yes. That's right. Okay, and now we're going to add two cloves of garlic, minced up, and we'll just let that go for about 30 seconds. We'll know it's time to move on when we start to smell it. Okay, so now let's add three cups of water. We're not adding all broth here that just don't sort of overwhelm the vegetables, so we're adding half water, half vegetable broth. And we like to use our homemade vegetable base. It calls for just a handful of veggies and some pantry seasonings. And our vegetable broth base is available on our website. It's a really good recipe. All right, so we'll bring this up to a simmer and then we'll continue. Sounds good. Okay, so our broth and water came to a simmer here and now we're gonna add half a cup of pasta. We're using orecchietti, but you could use any little short pasta. Gotcha. So we'll put those in and we'll let these go for five minutes. Okay, it's been five minutes, and now we'll add our green beans. I have eight ounces here cut into half inch lengths. Gotcha. Or if you wanted to be Francais, you could add haricot vert. Oh, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> those, those are just thinner, a little bit more delicate. Yeah, actually green beans and haricot vert are two different varieties. The haricot vert are nice and long and slender, and the green beans, well, they're a little bit thicker and sturdier, but you can use them interchangeably. So we're going to cook the green beans for three to five minutes. We want them to still maintain that nice green color and just a tiny bit of, not crunch, but tender crisp. Let's gotcha. Say. Okay, so it's been three minutes and you can see the beans are still nice and bright green there. So now we'll add those delicate veggies that just need a tiny bit of cooking okay. at the end. So I have one zucchini. We took the seeds out and cut this into quarter inch pieces. We also took the seeds out of this. One tomat <laughs> cut <laughs> into quarter inch pieces. I have one can of cannellini beans, and I'm going to add all this packing liquid too. It's, it's actually got a lot of flavor. It's full of salt and has a little bit of body to mm -hmm. it. We found that these beans have a comparable flavor and texture to cooking dried beans. You could also use navy beans if you want to. So really this just needs to warm through the vegetables we just mm. added need to tenderize a little bit, and that takes about three minutes. Okay. All right. It smells so good. It's beautiful too. Yeah, it's gorgeous. 
All right, so we'll turn that off. It's ready to go. It can hang out for a couple minutes okay. while we get to that pea stew, which is the very best part. It's <laughs> literally the soup, right? Yeah, it's this soup. makes it. A pea stew. Without it, it would just be soup. <laughs> wah, right. wah, wah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so starting with three quarters of a cup of fresh basil and half a cup of Parmesan cheese, third of a cup of extra virgin olive oil, and one clove of garlic that's minced up. And we're just gonna buzz this in the food processor for about 15 seconds till it becomes smooth. All right. Ooh. Ah, hit a basil. You mm. just know that's gonna be good, right? Oh yeah. Uh, so we'll put this in to a little serving dish. Let me just give it a little taste. I wanna make sure if it needs salt and pepper. I'll just add a little bit of pepper. Okay. All right, can I dish you up? Yes, please. Wow. So pretty. That is so beautiful. Now help yourself to some pea stew. You want to put a nice big dollop on there. Big dollop. Yes. All right. When you stir it into the soup a little bit, immediately you get the smell when it hits the heat of the broth. Mm. Every bite is a bonanza. I've got mm -hmm. pasta in there, zucchini, green beans, carrots, leeks, everything. Mm. So fresh tasting. Mm. You get the basil, the garlic. That pea stew totally makes it. This is not boring at all. It's brothy, it's not muddy. A lot of vegetable soups can get really muddy or be too tomato heavy. Mm -hmm. I like that this just has a little bit of tomato in it. It's just adding a little bit of brightness, but it's not taking over the whole thing and making it taste like a pasta sauce. Yeah, I agree. It's gorgeous. Yeah. I think it's just right, if I do say so myself. I think it's just right. <laughs> I think you're just right. Oh, you flatter me. <laughs> C'est bon. Oh, merci. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you'd like to be French like mon ami Becky <laughs> and make soup à pistou, start by sauteing leeks with carrot and celery, add vegetable broth and water, and then bring it all to a simmer. Add orchiette and then green beans. Stir in cannellini beans, zucchini, and tomato, and then make a pea stew. Process basil, parmesan, and olive oil all together until it forms a beautiful paste. Serve the soup with a generous spoonful of the pea stew and eat it all up. So from America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, a beautiful, vibrant, and bright Provençal vegetable soup. So good. Yeah, I love soup. Mm. <laughs> I love soup. Hashtag, I love soup. <laughs> Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.